everybody, and welcome uh, to this brand new spoiler review episode of Ahsoka from the Jedi Way. I am the outlaw John Roca, also known as Roca Fed in some corridors of the Star Wars universe, and I'm very excited to be welcomed by these two wonderful people. First off, Laura Kelly. How are you, Laura? How are things? Things are great, John. I'm very happy to be back talking about this show. Very excited. I love these Tuesday night premieres. All is good in the world, I gotta say. There's nothing like sitting back and relaxing at 6 p.m. Uh, on a uh, on a Tuesday afternoon or Tuesday early evening here, Kevin, and watching Ahsoka. How are you doing, Kevin Smets, the Smasher? How are you feeling, brother? Yeah, it's better than uh, setting your alarms, trying to get some sleep because you're a new father, and then waking up at midnight and, and trying to get that underway and then not being able to go to sleep. So it's yeah. good. You know, pr props to the music of our show, by the way. I texted you guys the other day randomly. Yeah. I think on Sunday. I just kept humming this song all day long. So I don't know why, but now it's probably going to be stuck in my head again. But it's better than uh, Baby Shark and all the kids' music that my daughter makes me listen to. So All the bluey stuff is what you're saying, yeah. all the bluey stuff. Yeah, happy Which, to be here. Thank you. Yeah, and shout out to Brian Ward. He's the one that picked the music, did the video and everything, and, the, uh, and was uh, so great when I was first launching the channel. Very kind to take the time. The to, video uh, without me and my yellow lightsaber. Yeah, well, we're getting to that, Kevin. Uh, we're getting to that. <laughs> we'll <laughs> figure it all I'm, out. I'm uh, easy. <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, you know, I'm just doing the intro here, everybody. But Laura Kelly will be guiding us uh, through these reviews of getting grave reviews on the uh, YouTube uh, comment section for Laura Kelly's ability to host the show. And uh, very gracious, uh, very happy that she was willing to do it uh after we had a conversation so uh, laura kelly please uh take it away thank you very much and thank you to everybody who left those nice comments i i sometimes i'm too afraid to look at the comments under the videos but that was very heartwarming so thank you yeah. very much to all of you for that so the ahsoka series picks up the pace in its third installment as we continue our pursuit for morgan elspeth and grand admiral thrawn part three delivers incredible action and it brings out the best in our heroes as we get to know the older, wiser, even more fierce versions of the animated characters we knew and loved. So, John, I go to you first. The dynamic between Ahsoka and Sabine has evolved in this episode. We also get a lot of references to samurai films and combat styles. Tell us a little bit about your overall thoughts of part three. I'll tell you what. You know, I'm recently working my way through The Bear, and we're halfway through the second season. And it's a Chicago show, Laura. I almost texted Good you taste. last night. We were watching it, wondering if you've seen it. Uh, but yes, it's amazing when they can shove into 28-minute episodes of that show, which is the standard length of each of those episodes. There's a, a couple, that one that's like 12 minutes, another one that's an hour that we're about to watch from season two. And so... The fact that you can shove in that much in 28 minutes, the initial reaction that I saw on social media was some anger from people that this was a, a, a short episode. But yeah. afterwards, that had that tune completely changed in some people from some people really enjoying this episode, and I'm one of those people who did. As you said, the samurai stuff right at the beginning, the fact that they called it Zatochi, that is a Zatoichi reference, and for me, being an old school and I mean old school samurai fan. I have collect. I have the Criterion collection of the Zatoichi collection. So to hear it finally have a name was an awesome, like Leonardo DiCaprio point at the screen moment for me from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But then seeing the relationships, you know, Laura, I've always said this. Like, I'm not going to tell you every ship and the name and the moniker and all. For me, it's about the relationships, the connections these characters make. And I really enjoyed what we got here with Sabine and Ahsoka, the conversations about the Force, that Echo stuff that's talked about in Star Wars Rebels. Then later, Hu Yang and the conversation she's having with Hu Yang about the Jedi Order versus non-traditional Jedi. And then Hera's conversation with the New Republic senators. All of that, the political intrigue done right in Star Wars is always fun to see. And yes, at the end, we get some fun pew, pew, pew Star Wars to make it a complete episode. So for me, top to bottom, this was a fun episode that I initially was hesitant to enjoy because of the low, a short length. But by the end, I was like, we got a lot more than we bargained for in terms of mythology and um, relationships and advancement of the storyline going into episode four. We certainly did. And I love that you're finally getting into the bear. That's so exciting. I oh can't God, wait to so good. get all of your thoughts. Yes. Um, so Kevin, I go to you next. This episode leans in a lot to those Star Wars Rebels feels. We also get a lot of connections to Luke and Obi-Wan training in A New Hope, a lot of connections to the Clone Wars. What else stood out to you uh, in your overall thoughts of uh, part three? 
I loved it. The, uh, the the training sequence with the sound design too of like Ahsoka mm. being one spot and then popping up in the other. And it reminded me of the Tales of the Jedi episode with Anakin and the clone troopers training Ahsoka too. Like, especially at the end when she's like, all right, let's get up. Let's do it again. Like, I mean, it's not as brutal as what Anakin was doing with Ahsoka, but it's kind of cool if you're a fan of that that series and like because i was a really a big fan of that short and seeing like now she's training someone else with her own method i thought that was great too and, and like the the nods of even like saying like how am i supposed to fight which is like a luke line like i loved that um so and i look i'm not i don't have as deep a cultured knowledge of the samurai movies but i do love samurai culture hmm. i know you'll probably laugh but i love the last samurai so again i love ed ed zwick like yeah. glory is one of my favorite movies so last samurai when that came out i like really got involved with like stupid st super stoked on that so seeing that whole uh thing uh, and then also like the the droid like hoang like mm -hmm. you know realizing that like he's probably trained every jedi we've ever heard of from coleman trevor who i love rest in peace coleman trevor uh <laughs> that's the dino jedi that fell like got killed by dooku if anyone doesn't know um, to him, to Anakin, to like Obi Wan, like this droid probably whipped out its General Grievous hands and was training them too. So that was quite a sight to see. And like, uh, yeah, I just overall I liked how they set everything up early on. Uh, it really, uh, really sets the tone uh, again. And like you're talking about overall, the only negative for me with short episodes is I enjoy them so much that I find that I keep like checking the runtime to see like how much time's left. Okay. 13 minutes left, two minutes of trailer. So 11 minutes left. Like I'll keep peeking. Cause like if that, that's a good thing, by the way, that means I'm enjoying it. If I'm looking at my watch for other reasons, that's not a bad, that's a bad thing. But so yeah, I had to toe. I really love this episode and the pacing and it just goes to show like, uh, don't freak out about a runtime. I don't know about a 12 minute episode. You're gonna have to explain to me how bear did a 12 minute episode. Oh, that dude. sounds cool. Like it sounds like they did. So it was, must've been part of the gimmick or whatever. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I'm incredible. excited. Like, I like that you'll get long ones, you'll get short ones. And, uh, yeah, that's, we were spoiled. We got two episodes back to back last week. So mm. yeah, they did great. Yeah, exactly. I had to say, I had a very similar reaction by the end of it where I just, I kind of felt the end coming and I was just like, no, 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 please yeah. don't. And then they just, they just ended there. So that's, uh, I was a little bit disappointed with the short run time, but in the same, in a good way. I was enjoying myself and I just wanted more. Um, you mentioned Hu Yang, who I'm really liking in this show. I really like how they're using him. I think he's being used very effectively because he brings that humor. He brings some lightness to every conversation. But at the same time, he's also bringing levity and he provides a lot of exposition. So they're just, they're, they're, it's a balanced use of him that I'm really enjoying. Um, we got some new characters revealed in this show, in this uh, episode that I I was very, very excited and ooing and aahing uh, the entire time that they were on screen. So I'm excited to get into that. Um, and in terms of some of the pacing, I like that this one picked up the pace a little bit. I am getting a little bit concerned, given where this episode ended, that we're maybe not moving as fast as I would have liked. I, I wish we kind of would have been a little bit further along, given that we're now more than a third of the way through this first season um, and almost at that halfway point. But for the most part, I'm I'm very looking forward to what we're going to be getting in the next uh, episode. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what I'm hoping we're going to get out of episode five, uh, which Dave Filoni is going to be. Uh, I read that episode directing. four run time is 42 minutes. Now I can't yes, confirm it. Yes, I saw that. Yeah. I saw that today, too. Oh, um, from go. Not totally sure where the source came from, but I but I also saw that. So and actually, you know what? I did see that Peter Ramsey, who did direct episode yes. four retweeted it which seems to verify that that's true so oh cool looking forward to a little bit longer runtime in episode four but getting back to episode three before we get to episode four we'll start at the very beginning aboard the t6 shuttle sabine goes through some basic saber training with Huyang yang and ahsoka uh tells sabine that her skill with the weapon comes from her mandalorian upbringing and those skills won't be enough to defeat our enemy and this is a lot of echoes of sabine's training with kane and jarrus and star wars rebels uh, Sabine is training her body, but she also needs to be training her mind. Um, so now we have to pay homage to Luke's first sky, uh, lightsaber training on the Falcon with Obi-Wan with the blast shield down. Um, Sabine does not have quite the quick success uh, that Luke does, but she does get very aggressive in her fighting style, style, which actually she ends up being okay and kind of holding her own by the end of it. Um, Ahsoka warns her that her anger and frustration are quick to give power, but they also leave you unbalanced. And later, Ahsoka tells Sabine that she did well in their training session. Sabine says that she's good with weapons, 
but the rest of it is a struggle, and she had hoped that the urgency of their situation would expedite her training, but she says she still can't feel the force. And Ahsoka clarifies that the force resides in all living things, including her. Sabine asks why everyone doesn't use it in that case, and Ahsoka tells her that talent is a factor, as well as training and focus will also help determine her success. So if Ahsoka uses the Force to drag a little cup across the table, um, and she says not everyone has the discipline to master the ways of the Force, she tells Sabine to start small, uh, and Sabine tells her she will do her best. And uh, later in the cockpit, Ahsoka tells Hu Yang that he is an asshole for telling Sabine that she's the worst Jedi he ever met, and he stands by his comments that the Jedi Order would not have accepted Sabine. He tells her that the Order's standards were proven over a millennium, and she points out that the standards failed. So Yang points out very few Mandalorians have become Jedi, and Ahsoka tells him she does not need Sabine to be a Jedi. She needs her to be herself. Yang says that Ahsoka comes from a long line of non-traditional Jedi, so in a way, Sabine actually fits right in, which is a great point, I think. And then back at the table, Sabine uses the Force, to, or tries to use the Force to move the cup and fails, walks away telling it, you win this round. So some great humor and really great action sequences, I think, in this training uh, section at the very beginning of this episode. John, what are your thoughts on the first third uh, in these scenes about, aboard the T6 at the very beginning here? Well, I like that we take our time, you know, in a way that maybe we didn't with Ray. And I and look, I want to say I'm walking oh. into a minefield a little bit by saying that. And I, I want to say this. First of all, I love Daisy Ridley. I think Daisy Ridley... Is awesome. I can't wait to see her back at, at as Ray. And I don't want to give credit to any of the neckbeards who are complaining about the fact that Ray could use the force so quickly. But it is a valid concern to have when you're watching a show because we get to invest in someone learning how to use something. We can connect to that in a universal way. Naturally, we most human beings like underdogs because we all think we're underdogs in a situation. And so having Sabine slowly figuring this out, going through these um, steps that they're going through in terms of training her. And I want to give a shout out to the samurai technique they're using. It's Tamash Tamashigiri. Uh, and then later on with these blades, these wooden swords that they're using called Bakken, seeing that come into Star Wars in a way that was that's very obvious. And of course, because of Filoni's connection with Lucas and Lucas's love of Kurosawa films, Hidden Fortress having influenced A New Hope. So seeing that come full circle here in this whole sequence, for me, it was really cool. I always spoke about the Zatochi, Zatochi situation. So all of that worked really well. But it's really about her getting back in touch with things. And how many of us, when we learn something or we get, we come back to something, there's always someone who's like, well, you're all right. You're not 100% there. Uh, and there's someone who is supporting you, wanting to push you to the next level, wanting to see what you can handle. And Sabine, for all her complaints on the ground, she's the one that wants to move quickly. She wants to learn quickly the expediency of the situation. She wants to get all this stuff. Ahsoka is going to train her at her pace, though, and try to bring her along as best as she can. And having the conversation about the Force, I think, was really important. Shades of Star Wars Rebels, I think Kane and Jarrah said this in the show as well, about it being in all living things. But it's also about an indication that they're expanding what the Force is to fit what we as a culture are much more open to receive about philosophy, about movements, about thoughts of certain things. And so I like that they're reflecting that just like they did back in 1977. So you're seeing these conversations and it's about talent, determination, and focus. That's something we can all, we can all relate to. Just because you have the talent doesn't mean you're going to get there, right? You put it in a sports term, a lot of these people are talented it's a matter of focus and determination that gets them to the next level. So there's connective tissue in that. And then we go to the conversation with uh, uh, Hu Yang. I really like this, that Hu Yang is, in essence, the balance on the ship. She is a non-traditional Jedi. We need someone steeped in the lore of the Jedi from 25,000 years ago to now. Kevin said it so well. He has trained probably every Jedi we've ever fallen in love with. Uh, and knows about them intimately. And so he is a good balance to her questioning of the Jedi Order, just as she did when she left all those years ago in Star Wars and Clone Wars. So I like that you've got that balance. And Sabine, I imagine, is going to take from both. So for me, this was a great way to kind of lay the groundwork a little more firmly about where everyone is going in this particular triangle and uh, where it's going to lead to in the end. And you bring up Hu Yang real quick. I want to say this. I think Hera not being a part of this mission, mission, which we find out later in the in the episode, 
is a smart move because Hu Yang kind of fills that role so well. Exactly. And I think we're going to get more of Hera, I would assume, mm-hmm. maybe late in the next episode. Uh, hopefully she catches up with them at some point. But yeah. we're in this beginning of this first step of this third episode, we're you know, spending a lot of time talking about what it takes to be a Jedi and what it means to be a Jedi and why Sabine will be different and how her history and how the Mandalorian her is going to sort of contribute and influence her training. Kevin, do you have any kind of thoughts about like Sabine's history and Ahsoka's history and maybe why we've sort of seen where that clash may have started at some point in the past and how we got to where we are and how it sort of contributes to this episode? We sort of seen them evolve a little bit in a really positive way and come together. What were your sure, thoughts on I, the first third year? Yeah, I think that like with Sabine too, like Mandalorian and Mandalorian culture, like she, you know, groomed from birth basically to like be a warrior. So right. it's got to be frustrating for her when now look, she's trying to learn another skill, another, the force, and it's not coming so easily to her. And as far as Ahsoka goes, at, I'm sorry, I'm talking about their early struggles that's off camera. She probably got frustrated and thought that, you know, she's not doing a good job of training that. And maybe is scared, like, man, if I'm not doing a good job, like I can't be steering her down the wrong path. But I really like that line where it talks about, un- I think it was like the line was like unorthodox Jedi lineage or like he's talking about you come from a line of un uh, not unorthodox, but uh, was unorthodox. it non-traditional maybe? Non-traditional. non-traditional. Yeah. And think about it. Ahsoka trained by Anakin. Anakin right. trained by Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan trained by Qui-Gon. Qui-Gon never followed the rules. Qui-Gon trained by Count Dooku. Mm-hmm. We know about having him and Qui- Dooku with Yoda. Like these are all like non-traditional Jedi. So to hear about that lineage is great. And, you know, at first I was a little uh, more like, oh, I want them to be only if you were born into Jedi, could you be a Jedi? But I'm really starting to warm up this idea that anybody could have it. And you think about it, like if you threw a pair of figure skates on me right now, I would uh, fall on my face. I would have break my ankle like I'd be horrible. Right. And uh, but if you know, you have to take a kid, if I was from the age of one or two taken from my family to go live at the Jedi uh, you know, figure skating academy and then <laughs> first skate every day, I would be like, you know, uh, Brian Boitano or whatever that guy is. From hey. the South. Yeah. Right. Like I would be a very good figure skater. So I really like that aspect of like, it must be frustrating. Like I wonder, we wonder like if Sabine, I don't think they would have, she wouldn't have been marked for someone to get taken from her family at an early age. Cause apparently the force is not as strong with her, but I wonder if she was training from the very beginning how she would do. And I, and you know, we've all done that thing with the cup, right? We've all done it. Trying to <laughs> use the force. And it, I couldn't help but think of the scene in mall rats when silent Bob is sitting there trying to like, <laughs> out of his hand. So, I mean, those are relatable things. And that's what got me kind of more on board with this. Like, yeah, like we'd all want to be a Jedi. Come on. I remember I was a drunk in college and a guy came up to me. We we're at this party and I was, I was, I was big frat guy. So I was my frat days, spiky hair. <laughs> piercings all over and this guy puts his arm around me and he's like hey man and we're having a great time he looks around and i never forget this he was like would you trade all of this right now for a working lightsaber in the force and i was like <laughs> hell yes i would hell yes That's a great so, icebreaker question yeah. perfect <laughs> so good times <laughs> yeah so we're, we're already three episodes in and this has already been a very i think rewarding journey just sort of seeing the progress that sabine's made so i can't imagine where we're going to end up with her by the end of this uh first season of this show um yeah. but i have to say my favorite version of sabine is like sarcastic smart ass sabine mm, mm. and we're getting a lot of that too so for the most part i'm really enjoying it but Moving on to the other side of that, although still sort of staying with some of the uh, the smart ass stuff um, aboard the Rebel command ship. Wait, wait, uh, I'm wait, sorry, wait. I gotta not stop Rebel. you, Laura. I gotta stop you. What are your thoughts about how Ahsoka spoke about the Force with Sabine? Do you agree with this kind of change in the philosophy, or are you saving your comments for later on in the episode? No, but... no, I can get into it. I just like it's it's just funny because I have. I've made it kind of a change in the way of thinking about it. I really was okay. not excited about this idea of Sabine being a force sensitive being. It just seemed like it was a being shoehorned in. I didn't like that. That was the storyline we were going. It didn't seem to make any sense after going four seasons of rebels. It's and in a lot of ways. It still doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And it seems to be sort of taking a departure from what we know, just kind of about the force and how it comes about and how it presents itself in individuals. Um, but on the other side of it, um, I think that sort of 
there's almost something sort of Spider-Man-y about it. Somebody made this uh, oh, made this sort yeah. of comparison to me where kind of anybody can have this sort of, this, you know, this kind of thrust upon them, this responsibility and this power. And I think at least kind of her, Sabine diving into some of the philosophies of the Jedi, at the very least, if that's all it ends up being and we don't ever see her pull that cup towards her, I think that will balance out her character a lot in a lot of good ways and sort of improve maybe who she is kind of and how she feels about things and how she understands the world and the galaxy. So I think it's going to be good for her, but that's, that's kind of where I end with it. I still am not totally sure where I land on the, are we going to see Sabine actually use the force? Mm. Not totally on board yet I i'm getting there and i've come around a little bit but i'm not quite there yet it's gonna be like yeah. the end of uh x-men the last stand when uh magneto finally uh he's trying he's trying to get his powers back and the very last shot you see the uh chess piece just wiggle a little it's gonna be uh, the very last shot the cup is gonna just just little and then it will cut to directed by dave lafaloni well <laughs> and, and maybe Laura, they foreshadowed that possibility because remember in the exchange between Ahsoka and uh, Hu Yang, she says, I don't need her to be a Jedi. I need her yeah. to be herself, her best version of herself. And maybe they're teasing that she won't actually get to be a Jedi, but being trained as a Jedi will help her to embrace her inner power, not necessarily force power. So I don't know. Yeah, 100% sure. I buy that for sure. Yeah. Cool. So moving on to our second section here of this episode, aboard a command ship with the New Republic fleet, Hera takes a call with the Chancellor and the, a Senate committee. Uh, Chancellor, now Chancellor Mon Mothma, asks about Hera's son, Jason, but Senator Ziono wants to move shit along because he is an impatient asshole. <laughs> and Hera, <laughs> Hera briefs the group on her investigation on Corellia, tells them that she believes the activity there is part of a larger operation involving Thrawn, um, and that she wants to send a task force to the Danab system to investigate further. Ziono accuses her of using New Republic forces, uh, resources, I'm sorry, for her personal quest to find Ezra when they could be using those resources to help the people of their fledgling Republic. Hera asks Ziono if he ever fought in the war. When he says no, she asks if he just sat back and waited to see who came up on top which is followed by an awkward silence, and it's fantastic. Um, and then another senator in the, uh, says that the Imperial fleet is scattered and has no central command, to which Hera says, unless Thrawn returns, he's not your typical Imperial officer. He tells him that, or she tells him that she spent most of her time fighting, most of her life fighting a war, and that's why she wants to help them prevent another one. So Ziono tells her that Thrawn is dead, Ezra is dead, and Hera snaps and says, you don't know that. Mon Mothma tells Hera she wants to take a moment to speak with the senators, so Hera thanks them and leaves. And in the hallway, Jason Sindula runs up to her and says, Chopper spilled the tea that Auntie Sabine is going to be a Jedi, and he tells Hera that he wants to be a Jedi. She tells him, yes, I know you do. And Mommy Hera is so sweet, and this is maybe one of my favorite things that we've seen in this show so far. I was so happy. Um, Jason's hair is darker green than we saw in the animated version of him. His ears are also hidden, so we can't see if he's got those little green tips that he had in animated form. He is very cute. I'm very, very happy with this casting uh, and this interaction. I was just very excited. Um, I also don't know um, much about biology, but in what world does this kid end up with brown eyes? when his parents have light green and light blue eyes. I don't know. Maybe the context didn't fit. When, uh, uh, it's, or, it's strange. Or maybe she had a little fun outside of Katie. Okay, all oh. right. So you know what? We got a strong conversation to be had about this. I will not take this Hera slander. I will not approve. <laughs> so at the end of this, Hera calls Ahsoka and Sabine and tells them that the Senate committee didn't approve her request to aid uh, right before the transmission is jammed and cut off. And we will stop there. And I go to you, Kevin, besides your theory on the salaciousness of Hera's relationships. <laughs> what were your thoughts on uh, these yeah. scenes and this interaction with the Senate? Well, first of all, uh, that Senator guy sucks. But I love that he got put in his place. And then to re realize, I hope I, fans, I wasn't a big fan of the show, but I still liked it. Like, And I caught up on it. Like, I, I would watch it. But Kazuto, that's his dad. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. the main character from Resistance. Had senator, father, male, or father and mother, or whatever, and that's the guy. It's not the same actor. I looked it up, but uh, it's the dad. So 
he's already he's always been one that wasn't wanting to like he was even like telling his son like not to get off or like go off at the resistance and stuff like that mm. go off at the resistance so i love that they were able to see that here i love interconnected stuff like that and that that's just a bonus for people that watch resistance you won't uh suffer while not knowing that information you still don't like this guy and you love that he's put in his place but uh, with the context of that like on top of everything else it's pretty cool to watch so um i love that and uh seeing little jason was great uh i just oh, one thing mon mothma i loved it but i really was hoping we'd get the caroline blackestein like total uh blackestein uh uh mop head you know what i mean not the mop yeah. head, but like the i don't know what the the really short different hair. hairdo yeah different hairdo it looks Come like on. she was looks like they were like hey real quick she's on the set of ahsoka's like can you shoot this real quick for this hollow cam scene it's like sure one alt and then does it but um jason first of all i love that they named him jason and they even confirmed or i saw that somewhere that it was named in honor of jason solo uh, mm -hmm. uh legends character it was uh one of the twins or whatever jason and jaina which was an epic storyline in legends where they were like twins and jason falls to the dark side and becomes Darth cadus and brother and sister fight Ooh, goosebumps just thinking about it some of the can non-canon stuff's really fun to watch or to read but uh jason it just made me think what happens to him he's not in the the sequel trilogy and i'm just never the one to think oh he probably just lived and happily ever after in a galaxy far, far away, I'm always like, if he's not there, he must have died miserably and horribly. Oof. Like, are we thinking it was he slaughtered by Kylo Ren or he wouldn't? It was that, like, what, what would what would be the age during the Academy slaughter with Kylo Ren? Because I'm kind of thrown off. I'm always messed up at the time. He's how old would he be then? Do you think he was one of the masters that got killed while Kylo Ren brought the uh, Knights of Ren there? Or do you think? He just uh, dies another way, and we're going to see it, and there'll be another tragic way where he saves his mother, or I don't know. What do you guys think? I don't know. He'd be in his late 20s around the time, I think, yeah. that Kylo Ren falls to the dark side. So maybe he, he got his training, and maybe he left, and he's off doing his own thing, and he's he's off being successful and happy somewhere else in the galaxy, not even remotely near what ahead. happens in the sequel trilogy. <laughs> Yeah, I just, I just get nervous whenever you meet a character that you like and you're like, oh, cool, yeah, I love him. Wait a second. He's not <laughs> in the sequel trilogy. Where the hell is he, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I also think with this, like, looming threat, and I know, and I'm not saying this in a negative way, but, like, where's Luke? Like, don't you think that someone would tell Luke, like, hey, man, will you stop work worried about, stop building the temple for a little bit. You know, you, you have your architects working on it. You don't need to worry about the floor plan. The pool's looking great. You got a waterfall in the back and vineyard with the tree. <laughs> Maybe you should come talk to uh, Mon Mothma and everything and say, hey, dude, this Thrawn guy is going to be a real threat. Because I'm sure he had heard the stories about it, you know, uh, yeah. when he was finally dialed in. So my question is, where's Jason now? And where was Luke during this episode and during this timeline? What do you guys think? The Luke Skywalker question, I think, is a good question. Because I'm like, if he doesn't have any students, right? Like, we're either in season two, season three-ish, somewhere in that area of The Mandalorian. And... Book of Boba Fett, I guess, but I I don't know. I guess maybe he's out looking for students. I don't he's busy. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he's gonna show up in this. I do I have heard people sort of ask that question, but I'm I feel like it might take away from the yeah. story that we've got. And I don't know. He's we would maybe have heard in the about Filoni him, movie. Think. Maybe in the Filoni movie. I mean, if they're gonna have a, a Filoni movie is gonna be an Avengers type level event, he gotta have Luke's like and it, it's not just because we need it and we demand it. And I'm not saying that as a fanboy, but I'm just thinking in terms of like you know, they did a great job of explaining why Ezra wouldn't be around during the original trilogy. It's because, you know, he's been far off. He was taken away by the Purgle. I love that they were able to explain away where Thrawn is, right? So we could have him after the events of the original trilogy. But now I'm wondering, these current events, it looks like things are going to probably get dire before they get better. Uh, wh where's going to be Luke and fitting into all this? And, you know, mm. again, Jason, just hope he, he lives a happy long life and became a moisture farmer somewhere. <laughs> Here's open. Uh, yeah, so Jason Sindula revealed in episode three of the Ahsoka show. Uh, he's got a pauldron on his right shoulder that looks a little bit like the one, a mini version of the one that Kanan wore in early seasons of Rebels. Uh, shout out to every everyone on Twitter who spot the eagle eyed people who spotted that because I definitely missed it in the two times I watched it. Uh, <laughs> John, do you have any do you have any uh, input and any thoughts on this yeah. sort of middle section with Hera, especially given the fact that like. I mean, it kind of begs the question, will Hera eventually succeed in gaining the New Republic assistance in her quest to find Thrawn, or are we going to see her break away 
from her military role and joined Sabine and Ahsoka in this hunt for Ezra and Thrawn. What do you think? Well, first of all, I enjoyed seeing the Republic Defense Fleet, uh, the new Republic Defense Fleet, fleet sitting out there. That was pretty cool to see that as a uh, establishing shot before we got inside uh, the command ship um, and saw everything with uh, with Hera. This is the kind of Star Wars uh, Star Wars I like when it's done well. I didn't particularly like it in the prequel trilogy. No offense to anybody who likes the prequel trilogies, but all that Trade Federation nonsense just lost me. Not because I didn't understand it. It's because it wasn't well done, for, in my opinion. For me, this back and forth makes a lot of sense. And it's, it's really interesting because, look, this, this is a diverse group of senators. There are people of color throughout this thing, so it's diverse. And then you've got Hera saying, hey, we need this. We need to get this. And you have people saying, no, you know, it's your personal feelings or no, the empire is scattered or uh, Senator Rodrigo, I think that's her name. She says, but they signed loyalty oaths. They couldn't possibly be imperial. So it's just this kind of convenient uh, <laughs> ignorance or convenient stupidity that politicians do because they don't want to deal with a massive threat because they look at things in a provincial way. And there were things in that back and forth with Hera that I found to be very smartly written and very accurately laid out um, because, you know, people always are like, no, no, it's not true. It couldn't possibly be happening. You're ridiculous, blah, blah, blah. And then boom, things happen. And they're usually the ones behind the eight ball or the ones trying to get out of that situation and find a way to uh, save their reputation and save their brand. So I'm going to be real curious to see if we come back and check in with these senators once Thrawn comes back to see their reactions or to see if any of them have possibly been siding with the Imperial people. And that's why they were trying to say like, oh, no, nothing's going on. You're being ridiculous, blah, blah, blah. And we're not going to send you a fleet to help your friends over there who are trying to go find Thrawn. So a lot of that is great. But this is also a great showcase for Mary Elizabeth Winstead to even more firmly um, encapsulate this version of Hera Syndulla. There's some nice face acting going on when she's not speaking for Mary Elizabeth Winstead in this scene. And her flare-up when uh, uh, Giono mentions Ezra's death, although heroically, is really strong. And I love that. Uh, and I like the standoff that she has with him when she calls him out, saying, hey, you didn't fight in the war. I guess you were just waiting for whoever won for you to make your move and there's no follow-up comment between the both of them and i imagine that stare would have lasted a good 30 minutes before somebody said something in that back and forth and it took that other senator to kind of break the ice but mon mothma does not stop Hera, does not um side one way or the other and in the end they don't decide to send it but don't discount mon mothma we know how she plays behind the scenes she makes the right moves she knows which side to be on so I would not be surprised if she finds a way to have Harris and Dula go and help um, Sabine and Ahsoka because of what happens at the end of this episode there on Sitos. I would not be surprised that Mon Mothma has an, a part in that, which I thought seemed to come through because she didn't seem adamantly against Hera uh, and not adamantly for the senators or for her. So she's going to play her game, which I really appreciate uh, seeing in all of this uh, for sure. And then Jason's great to see. I mean, I thought that was fun to see him popping down. But again, watch Mary Elizabeth Winstead's face when she when he says he wants to be a Jedi. Remember, Kanan died, you know, and I know he's not a, he never became a full Jedi, right? Because his training was uh, uh, truncated, but still was able to teach Jedi stuff to uh, Ezra. So the idea that she might lose him again or lose her son is a possibility. And in the meeting, she says, you know, Thrawn took some of our friends and family. So clearly... Uh, alluding to, I think it was season four, that episode Jedi Knight in Star Wars Rebels, where uh, the death of Kanan Jarrus happens, which is still an emotional episode for me to watch to even think about, because uh -huh. I love that character so much. So I like that there's a lot of stakes from Hera's side of things that are laid out in this back and forth with everybody. And there's clearly immediate stakes with her son. So, And she comes from a family that fights. Her dad fought, and she got into the war at a young age, just like Ahsoka did. So there's a lot of connective tissues with her and Ahsoka. So I'm very curious to see how that's going to play itself out in the next few episodes with her actions. So Yeah, yeah. Mary Elizabeth Winsett is definitely killing it here as Hera. Mm. I really like this sort of new take that we're getting because in Rebels, we did not see a lot of Hera losing her cool. 
That mm -hmm. was not a feature of that character yeah. by any means. Like, I mean, very much on the opposite end of that. So we, we've seen some evolution. She's come a long way and she's seen a lot of shit in the last couple of years. And that's definitely affected, I think, her demeanor a little bit. Um, and it's just interesting to see how she's sort of grown. Um, I feel John, like I really... also her frustration comes from, all right, this is happening all over again. Like, yeah. we already yeah. had a, yes. a galaxy that wasn't acting. And now um, this is like deja vu. Is not anyone caring about this. Yeah. And I think that that builds into the frustration. This is a different era, you know, you know, several years later after a full war, we didn't see her fight, but we know she was fighting and she was there. So uh, it's a good yeah. call that she's definitely, uh, you know, at, at wit's end at this point. Like, are you serious with this yeah. again? Yeah. Kevin, and, and you know this, Kevin, anyone who studies history, the military and politicians always at loggerheads whenever there's wars or the impending war about how to go about this because they both have different interests in mind yeah. not, not choosing sides just saying they both have different interests in situations like that i do like the theory john that mon mothma is like going to be kind of working behind the scenes to potentially yeah. help Hera in this situation like I, I kind of question i'm like is is this how this story is sort of going to end is Hera just going to get frustrated and up and leave the new republic and take mm -hmm. jason and chopper and hop in the ghost and go join sabine and, and ahsoka on their quest and the idea of, of Hera giving up that position as a general in the New Republic is not super appealing to me. So right. the I, the theory that there could be something sort of happening on the back end with Mon Mothma sort of putting some things into work to try and help um, I, I, is really appealing to me. So I, I like that idea a lot. Hopefully we get more of Mon Mothma in this series as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I, component I, sorry, I do want to address one thing with uh, Kevin, yeah. the Luke thing. Yes, I do think Luke will show up in this series at some wow. point. Ooh. I think we will absolutely see Luke in the Filoni movie, um, but it may be a recast, not the CGI. I think eventually we are going to have to accept this. And so I think this is what's going to happen in the long run. And I, I do think Jason was a Knight of Ren. And so I worry about that. So I just wanted to throw my two cents in on that. Whoa! <laughs> but, but then again, I mean, Star Wars has shown us through Ahsoka that you can have a character dance through stuff we've already seen and somehow not affect the events or be seen in the events and do some retconning. So maybe that could go the way, but I think... So Jason we see him killed in Rise of Skywalker? He yes, did. I think he was. Yes, think. You're going to have to point out which one Nick, when we all do a watch. <laughs> the one, one with again. the green which hair. One, which one's Jason? <laughs> Do people really need more reasons to dislike the rise of Skywalker? Because <laughs> we need to give more. the fans more of that. Um, I, don't, I don't, for that reason alone, I hope that you're wrong. <laughs> um, if, if we're done with this section, we should take a break, Laura, for the podcast, and then uh, we'll jump in the section. Is that good for you? Sure. Let's okay. do it. Let's do it. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back with the rest of the episode right after this. All right, Miss Kelly, take it away. Well, the T-6 exits hyperspace into the Danab system and is pursued by six fighters being led by Shin Hati. Ah ah Ahsoka pilots and Sabine takes the tail gun and Ahsoka and Sabine are really not working particularly well together at the beginning of this attack. So as Hu Yang is actually quickly to point it out, which is again kind of funny, but Ahsoka takes a breath and asks Sabine what she needs. And only then is Sabine able to take the first fighter out. So Sabine takes out two more, just as the super hyperspace ring comes into view. Um, she joins Ahsoka in the cockpit as Morgan Elspeth orders the, her ship to open fire on the T-6. Meanwhile, Hu Yang is uh, trying to quickly scan Morgan's ship for intel and for details. Um, and the T-6 uh, in that moment takes a hit in a way that actually made me gasp. I thought the ship, the whole cockpit was going to blow up or something. Mm. Uh, but miraculously, everybody aboard except Hu Yang is fine. And But the T-6 is badly damaged. Um, and Shin, very disrespectfully, tells Morgan, congratulations, you almost got them. Shin is an <laughs> asshole, and I love her so much for it. It's my favorite thing about her. Uh, so Shin Hati and the remaining two fighters, one of which is Marak, uh, pursue the T-6. Sabine works on the ship, and Ahsoka takes a spacewalk. Ahsoka walks out onto the wing slash hull of the ship wearing an interesting spacesuit, complete with custom covers for her head tails, Montrall's <laughs> things. Uh, she deflects gunfire with her lightsabers and slices up one fighter. Uh, and the explosion makes Sabine think that Ahsoka is dead, but Ahsoka floats by in the viewport, which got a legit laugh out loud from me because it was just kind of ridiculous. Uh, Sabine fixes the ship, intercepts Ahsoka, and flies towards the surface of Cetos, where they encounter a school of Pergil. 
Perkle seemed to be a new experience for Shin Hati as she appears to be quite stunned when she encounters them, when she and Merrick encounter them as they pursue the T6. Uh, however, the T6 evades the fighters and lands in the forest, who Yang wakes up and does not seem alarmed or surprised that they all almost died in this excursion. They shut all the power off so it would not be detected as Ahsoka shuts off Hu Yang, a la uh, uh, Leia in Empire Strikes Back. Um, and they wait it out and then turn it back on. Sabine tells Ahsoka that she hasn't seen those creatures since the day Ezra disappeared, and Hu Yang shows them the scan of Morgan's vessel, saying that it's still under construction. But he confirms that a hyperspace ring, that it is a hyperspace ring with these levels or a hyperspace ring with these levels could be capable of hyperspace, a hyperspace jump of astonishing speed and distance. Hu Yang tells them, in theory, if one, knew, if one knew the coordinates, you could use it to jump to a neighboring galaxy. And he says that the Jedi Archive spoke of intergalactic hyperspace lanes between galaxies, which used to follow the migration paths of Pergil. And we end the episode with Balin telling his squad of helmeted aliens, plus maybe one droid, to hunt down the T6 in the forest. So I go to you, John. Uh, mm. Disrespectful Shin. We get just a little cameo <laughs> of Morgan Elspeth, a little cameo of Balin. Uh, and we have an Ahsoka Tano spacewalk that looks like something straight out of Clone Wars. What were your thoughts on the uh, Act 3 of this third episode? Morocco can talk. Oh, my God. Here <laughs> we can. go. Didn't sound like Ezra, but uh, I don't know. He tasseled his hair a little bit. No, I'm just joking. I don't know. I thought, I thought it was, I did enjoy this uh, section of the show because we got kind of a slow, not slow in a negative way, slow build to this moment with the previous two uh, uh, sections of the show. So the pew, pew, pew stuff was awesome. I mean, the space, space battle stuff was really well done, I thought. And I liked the fact that we didn't just uh, slide into knowing how to work with each other, that there were two strong female alphas in that situation uh, and Hui Yang, who is the 25,000 el year old elder, had to be like, will you kids stop it and figure out how to work together? And Ahsoka, who had just told Sabine earlier in the episode about how she needs to be in tune with the Force, had to kind of swallow her pride a little bit and follow Sabine's lead, which is something that maybe Ahsoka hasn't done in a very long time, follow anyone's lead. And so, but it did work out. And that's the way to go about finding some equality here in this relationship. And I thought that was a nice way to see it. Of course, the shades of... Han or Luke or Finn in the tail gun shooting. Uh, that was really fun to see uh, and taking care of business. Loved her spacewalk. As you said, that's something you would see in an animated episode of Star Wars. So to see it live action, I thought was a lot of fun. And it worked. The budget they're using for this these space battles, it looks really good and authentic. And yes, Laura, you're so right to point out the funny moment of her floating by going, you figure this out yet? You know, this is, <laughs> this is the calmness of Ahsoka. She has seen so much. That for her, it takes a lot to rattle her. So she just rolls with the punches and figures out how to make this whole thing work. And by the same token, inspiring Sabine to use her natural abilities with technology to figure stuff out and fix stuff like she can, like she did with the ship. So I like that, that they had that connection and did all of that. The, space, the um, hyperspace ring, fascinating stuff to consider, especially with we, getting live action Pergils, which was an awesome, awesome moment. I thought the flights uh, battle sequence around the Purgle was very reminiscent of what we saw in Solo, a Star Wars story, when they were yeah. doing the Kessel run around all those things and whatever. So I thought there was nice shades of that in terms of continuity that worked so well. But hearing the fact that they that this is old stuff, that this is from the Jedi archives, that the migration patterns of the Purgles were what they followed to do intergalactic travel is just mind-blowing to hear that uh and to me it felt like both this that conversation and the conversation earlier between ahsoka and um and hu yang is them laying the groundwork of old jedi that is what mangold's film is supposed to be about so i know they're laying the seeds for the filoni film but the mangold film may borrow some stuff or this may be the beginning of like getting everybody to understand the knowledge that they're going to be using in the Mangold film down the road when they're looking at the beginnings of the Jedi. So all of that just worked so well. Uh, and I do like the final one with Balin. He didn't say kill them. He said hunt them down because he does have respect yeah. for uh, so, uh, for Ahsoka. And uh, we, again, we don't know what uh, Balin is going to do. So I like that that's kind of still up in the air. And yes, uh, Shin Hati and um, Morgan Elsbeth. Throwing shade at each other in space is just fantastic. 
And I love Morgan Elsbeth becoming the second in command in Austin Powers, screaming for the turbo lasers. I love that she did that. <laughs> that was awesome for me. So uh, just great, great stuff here to end the episode for me personally. That echoes the oh, best. I didn't even realize that Morgan Elsbeth is like, it's giving Frau. She is awesome. Frau. That's She's totally Frau. Awesome. Please. That's Please. amazing. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, so the Pergil had a blink and you'll miss a cameo in, on, on Cetos in part two, but we yeah. see them in all their glory up close and personal in the ac action sequence uh, as Ahsoka and Sabine make their way to the surface on Cetos. Kevin, uh, what did you think about seeing the Pergil in live action in this big way? And the Shin, Shin with the disrespect towards Morgan, are we going to see Balin stuck in the sort of middle of this tension between the two of them? What are your oh, thoughts? I have a hot take. I have a hot take on that. But Ooh, what about oh, yes. the Pergil real quick. I remember what, first hearing about space whales and stuff. I was like a little bit like eh, during Rebels, I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I wasn't like, like negative and posting on message boards about it. But I was like, all right. <laughs> space whales we're getting a little crazy here but again it's in a universe where there are laser swords and people jumping you know but uh I, I by the time they they figured out with ezra about and how he goes away with thrawn i actually really like the purgle so seeing him live action was great it also kind of maybe debunked my there was a couple of, like there's obviously there are all these theories going around of who merrick is right and yeah. when i was like Oh, Merrick right now, if he starts waving at the Purgle to start like, you know, the, the stopping, you know, uh, Ezra or sorry, Ezra, Sabine and um, uh, Ahsoka, I'm like, then that's that's Ezra, right? He control. He's friends with the Purgle, but he doesn't really react that way. So and I was really going with this theory where like, I came up with this theory. I'm like, OK, Ezra is the only one who can use the world between worlds, which can also do time and space. Mm. So maybe he and Thrawn became best buddies and Thrawn's like. You gotta go back and you gotta go back over there, get Morgan and help protect Morgan and help me find a ship to come back to to you know how to get to me. You know, I, I was convinced of that, but now not so much. Now, after seeing a Whitware interview, just before we went on the air, by the way, where he talked about when they were doing rebels, they had long conversations about making Starkiller one of the inquisitors. And one of the important things he said, one of the main things that George Lucas and uh, Dave Filoni wanted to make sure is to make sure that the Inquisitor. Galen, Galen Merrick, by the way, Merrick, Galen, I think it's Galen Merrick, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, had a personal relationship with Vader. So that's why now I don't think, I think Merrick's just going to be someone. Like, but if it's Starkiller, that would be fantastic. But that race through the, uh, uh, with all the Purgle was just great. Like you said, it reminded me also of Solo, a Star Wars mm -hmm. story. I love those sequences there. And um, before that, too, the dogfight in space, like there was the oh, New Hope homage, even with music, musically, like they didn't full on do the the uh, the TIE fighter fight theme from A New Hope. But they had like done, 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 like the beginning, like that same kind of drum procession, which I absolutely adored. But um, yeah, so the Purgle, like now I dude, I don't at this point, I you know, I saw somewhere that like Merrick is the is one of the blue logos, like in the opening. It's like you have red mask, bad guy, good guy mask, but it's blue. Yeah. In this episode, it's blue. So that's why they're like, he's Ezra because he used to be good or whatever. Who knows? I Right now, I'm just enjoying the ride. But I will say this Shin and Morgan thing, okay? <laughs> they're, they're not planting these seeds because it, they're going to end up being best friends. Like, right. I think at no. some point, Morgan's going to go full on Sith, not Sith witch, but witch of Dathomir on her using all the green power is going to start messing up shin balin's going to come in to protect his apprentice she's going to kill balin and then shin so balin will be dead shin will be alive and then help out our heroes at some point later mm -hmm. that's my hot take right there you've heard it here um but yeah so i but you're, you're the planting those seeds you just love when two people don't get along and just a little snide like oh you congratulations you almost got him like i think eventually she's gonna morgan's gonna establish like uh just who do you think you're been talking to <laughs> and i think that's gonna create a big strife between the three of them i think that dynamic <laughs> might be what uh leads one of them to kind of join our heroes or at least uh break off from morgan and all of them so I know I just gave you guys a lot of info there, but, and then the spacewalk real quick, right when she came out at first, I was like, Oh God, no. Like, and not because I actually, I like the last Jedi and sorry, I'm maybe half, I'm going to lose half my Twitter followers. I actually <laughs> like the last Jedi, but I, I understand people's complaints about the Mary Poppins moment. And I was like, if they yeah. do another Mary Poppins moment where we have to argue about this over the next two years, 
please don't. But they actually, like you said, it was straight out of Clone Wars. It was great. The only thing Clone Wars had was like the big, they had the big round yeah. like uh, oh, fishbowl right. helmets. So it's the cool. helmets, yeah. Her helmet was really cool. How it like worked with her, you know, whatever those things are, the Laku. I think that's for Twilight, but whatever. It it looked really cool, and uh, yeah, like straight up like igniting the saber and like standing there and. Uh, it reminded me of Luke and Endor, like standing, squaring off against the speeder bike coming. So, uh, yeah, it was great. Yeah, we get Mandalorians on the whole of the ship in the uh, Rebels season three finale, and it's it's kind of cool. They're like magnetized to it, which I think yeah. is sort of the mm. same like technology Ahsoka's using in this situation. Uh, but it reminded me of that that whole sequence a lot. Uh, John, I go to you. Are they bringing Star Killer into this show? Oh Jesus, that is. Uh... <laughs> I don't know, man. That's a lot. I mean, I, I that's a lot of mythology that even the people who know Star Wars Rebels may not know as deeply as as the people who played the game. So I would be I'd be really surprised if they did that because there's a lot of legwork I think they would have to do to make that yeah. a thing. Um, but then again, I wouldn't put them past him to try to do it. Filoni Filoni has magic in his hands sometimes, and so or a lot of the time, and so I, I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to do it i just hope if they're going to do it that it's um well done because there's nothing that'll piss a, a, a star wars fan base <laughs> off more than than introducing cal kestis and fumbling the ball in the introduction live action because for years people have won i'm oh, sorry not cal kestis sorry a uh, star killer for years people have wanted to see star killer uh uh in live action so i yeah. hope if they've done it they're doing it right uh for sure yeah, I think that would take away from the mm. the central, I don't know, story of the show a little bit too much. So I kind of hope yeah. that uh, Maroc is just, an, the name is just an homage to that. Yeah, I think if, uh, if you're going to have him be anyone of interest, instead of being a, a very popular character from a video game, I think Ezra would make more sense if you're trying to keep it condensed in this storytelling, right? Um, yeah. I don't necessarily think it's him anymore, but um, yeah. Yeah, Michael brought up in the Geek Buddies review that um, she's a, that the Night Sisters do control people. So, hmm. is that possible that a Night Sister is controlling Ezra, and that is Ezra in there? Is that how you get to that point? I don't know. I don't know. So there's, I can, I suppose I could find validity for it being Ezra. I just, I, I would like it not to be Ezra, but yeah. <laughs> there are any characters you Laura like better than Ezra in it? What's that? See what I did there? Oh, Shout yeah, out yeah. to Josh McCoo. I stole that from Josh McCoo. Sorry. <laughs> no, I think that I, I think that Mer I think he's just who he is. I think he's just a random inquisitor that somehow survived this long. He's just our answer to all the Jedi who survived this long. And uh I think he's just who he is. But I don't know. We'll see. That inquisitor died in Rebels, right? The one from the first so season. The one, the, like the eighth brother that we see, like kind of take yeah. off with this helicopter saber, but it's damaged, and so he falls into uh, Malachor and like some right. pit somewhere. I don't know. He looks a lot like he's his his costume, his helmet. A yeah. lot of it is very similar to the look of Morak. So I would not be surprised if yeah. there's if maybe they're the same person. I mean, Ahsoka escaped from. The te from the Malachor Temple somehow, so maybe yeah. he did too. Maybe they escaped together. I don't know. Maybe they're somehow old friends. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like if it was like they, yeah. it wouldn't be a big deal to hide it. Like it's either he's nobody because they're not trying to hide this big reveal that matters to the storyline. Because I don't right. think it would be such a big reveal. Of, I am the eighth brother, that, or eighth, you know, that had the lightsaber helicopter thing, right? But like if it was Ezra, that would be a reason to hide it, right? Or if it's Star Killer or whatever. But or if it's nobody, if he's just a regular person, which I think is short, clean, is probably what I would lean towards wanting mm. to happen. But you never know. Yeah. I'll be excited either way to find out. Maybe he got burnt on Mustafar like Anakin, so he's covering himself up. I don't know. I'm throwing it out there. I don't know. Well, I mean, that brings me to final thoughts. I mean, Kevin, you've been wanting to see Anakin in the show. We. Three episodes in, we still haven't seen or heard him, but hopefully we're maybe one week away from getting some Anakin content. What do you think we're going to get out of episode four? Uh, I think like I think that that audio we heard in the trailer is going to mm -hmm. be a show, whether we're gonna just her listening to it and like remembering it or if we're going to see it, you know, or she's looking at like an old Clone Wars era holograph training video or Sabine stumbles upon it on the ship. Like that might be something cool. Uh 
I, I, I don't want to get too much into it because I think I, I don't want to sp- speculate too much because I read a leak a long okay. time ago and I want to respect our fans. You could find it out there of what the predominant theory of how they're going to incorporate him. And if that's the case, man, I really can't wait and I'm all for it. But um, from what we do know as fans, as far as listening to the trailer, I, I do hope we get to see it. I'd love I just want to see I see a lot of fan art of it. It's great. Of I want to see him in his Clone Wars era armor with the shoulder pads. And Hayden, like de aged, you know, giving Ahsoka a young. And, you know, they did, there is in the, I don't know if this is a spoiler, but I know that a, a cast list that had a younger era, they have a younger Ahsoka actress, I think, at some point during yes. the season. I remember uh, that. An that... actress that's playing a younger Ahsoka. So is that for flashbacks? Like, I don't, I don't know. Hopefully yeah. that's not too spoilery. If not, interesting. Sorry, no, I remember that casting announcement coming out okay, that, yeah. that one of the actresses from House of the Dragon had been cast as the young Ahsoka. So, I don't know. Maybe we'll get that at some point. That'll be very exciting. Uh, John, any final thoughts? Oh, I don't know. I I I think that we're gonna see it. I'm I'm pretty sure we're gonna get some flashbacks at some point. Force ghosts. Dave Filoni Dave Filoni loves flashbacks. I don't know if we'll get force uh, force ghosts. I think we'll get flashbacks. (sighs) And if Dave Filoni could flashback and do a live action Clone Wars scene, there's one guy that would want to do it. It would be that guy, right? Right. (laughs) Uh, yeah. I I wouldn't want to see. A force ghost situation i i think i think the flashback even though now we're you know there was a long time where star wars never did flashbacks we've now seen them do it a little more frequently in the most recent yeah. star wars stuff so i'd be cool with that to be honest with you because it could be interesting for ahsoka to deal with the trauma of anakin to watch us see her deal with it because her reaction to hera bringing up uh anakin in the first episode and you saw hera react like oh shit you know i shouldn't have said that it's clearly a, a open wound for her still. So I wonder if there's some dealing with this trauma stuff that's going to pop up for her. Maybe with Sabine, maybe something triggers in the war with maybe Balin makes some kind of reference to Anakin. Certainly we see it in the trailer that he did mention. Yeah. He mentions Anakin and that could be the thing that triggers. And maybe the whole fight is flashbacks of them as they're fighting with each other, flashing back to their experiences as Jedi. That could be really interesting um, as well. Could even pop up if she has conversations with Luke like she did in The Mandalorian season three. Oh, no, wait. In the Book of Boba Fett, rather. <laughs> Get them all mixed up. In the Book of Boba Fett. <laughs> the Mandalorian episode in the Book of Boba Fett. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, right, exactly. So there could be a conversation with Luke uh, that triggers something there for her uh, now that she knows. You know, it could be interesting. So just I, 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 that's the way I would want to see it if we are going to see uh, that to be and look, I know people are gonna hate me for this. I mean, but you know, I mean, Hayden's not the strongest actor, so you want to limit the amount of time you see Hayden play the role. Don't come wow. for me. There's a reason you only wow. saw him in a couple of scenes in the. the he was good in Life as a House, bro, and Shattered uh, Glass. Please, Shattered Glass is great, but that was 35 years ago, Kevin. So I mean, I, I just jumper. Come on, man. <laughs> Again, 35 <laughs> years ago, Kevin. So for me, it's more a matter of I think with Anakin. And with uh, um, uh, Hayden Christensen, less is more. And so I, th- I think that's the way they want to go about it. Please feel free to kill me for that. But that's, that's my job. I hate you. That's what I, if you texted me that, I would send you the gif of, of Hayden saying, I hate you. If this, was text, if this was a text conversation. That's what it was. Yeah, fair point. Fair point. <laughs> no, I think that's fair. Um, I, I, I've had some, I've been sort of thinking about a different Jedi in, as we've gone through this, this Ooh. episode. I don't really like this practice of dancing around all the Kane and Jar- Kane mm. and Jarrus references and not actually mentioning him. Yeah. The Mandalorian did this with Duchess Satine, and I didn't like it there either. So I feel like there were a lot of opportunities in this episode to mention him. I mean, Sabine's blinded training sequence, how she has to like learn how to see things in a new way, what, like when he did, when he lost his sight. I just feel like, like the opportunity was right there. We're just not mentioning my name and it's weird. It's just strange. And I get that you don't want to like, maybe you don't want to alienate the fans that didn't watch the animation, but like, it's right there. Like, come on. I mean, I Jason, it, right? Jason could be saying, yeah, you have Jason like right my there. dad, you know? Yeah. Right. Well, it reminds me yeah. of like in the movies in 2000, like X-Men, like they were so afraid to have like the comic accurate costumes, right? So mm. everything had to be dark leather and like you couldn't really be on the nose, like looking like the comic books. And it finally took Iron Man and the MCU for people to be like, oh no, you can get pretty good with these costumes you know, uh, and make them look like, and I feel like that, like the same thing, like sometimes Star Wars is afraid 
to give too much reverence to things that were, you know, are from the animation. And it's like, well, you, you have Hera full on, you see the sun full on, like give Jason a, a name, you know what I mean? Give him a shout out. Like, you know, I don't know. Did, is Freddie Prince and Disney on good terms? I assume they are. He did say he wouldn't want to play him live action. And they're not. I don't think he is. I really don't. I don't think he is. Am is I out of guess? it? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, no. I don't... There have been some issues. <laughs> You'll have to tell me. Some... I, think, I feel like I'm, something came right over my head. Things but, have been said. Um, and so I, I'm I'm not banking on it, which is really unfortunate. I love the character, Kane and Jarrus, and I would love to, see, even if it was just flashbacks, would love to see him pop up in some form in animation but or in live action, but I'm, I'm not banking on it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, I do have a feeling, you know, there's some things we haven't seen in the trailer that from the trailers we haven't seen in the show yet. I have a feeling we're going to see some of these, the Sito scenes, the uh, dual scenes where we've got Ahsoka versus Balin and Shin versus Sabine in episode four. But I have a feeling in part five that we're maybe going to cut away from what we've established with Hera and Sabine and Ahsoka. And maybe we're going to check in with like Thrawn and Ezra. And the only reason I think that is because Filoni is directing part yeah, five. That's point. my theory. Good point. Woo! Yeah, I'm down with that. Uh, that's all I got on ep on episode uh, three, part three so far. Do you guys have any final thoughts you want to share before we, we wrap it up here? I do have one. Oh, when yeah. is Jason going to start showing a Laku? Or is it if it, it is it the male that has the dominant gene? Like, or do you think like he has little ones back there or like, or it's hidden? Like, how does that work? I, I'm not, I don't know about interspecies. Like his leku are wherever his proper eye color are. It's just, I, it, I don't know. It's just, I thought you were going to say they were point. somewhere else. This, this fool, <laughs> this fool trying to turn him into a mullet, trying to turn into a mullet. Like when does that start showing? <laughs> <laughs> when does he start oh, listening man. to space heavy metal? When does that happen? We were all thinking it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man evan witten as jason sandula by the way i think he knocked it out of the park looking forward to seeing seeing more yeah so good <laughs> all right let's wrap it up laura all right well thank you so much uh for joining us for this episode we appreciate it madly we love love talking about star wars and certainly we love diving into this series and uh seeing what we're getting episode to episode shortest episode so far We'll see what happens next week at a, as a 42-minute episode, what more we're going to get. But I think Laura has a lot of the right instincts here on that episode five is going to be a really massive episode for this series. And we seem to be, build, be building up to something really big happening there in episode five. So I'm sure we'll get a lot. We'll have a lot of fun breaking that one down uh, when it happens. Uh, another fun show, Laura. Please uh, let people know where they can find you. Sure, come find me on Twitter. You can find my show, uh, Force Toast, a Star Wars happy hour at Force Toast Pod. You can find me on Twitter at shut up underscore Laura. And I did want to plug that Force Toast returned with a regular it's episode regular episode scheduled this past week. We had our episode on Tuesday on August 29th. We covered uh, recent news, the Ahsoka series, and we did a spoiler for your review of the book Star Wars Inquisitor, Rise of the Red Blades. So check mm. that out uh, wherever you get your podcasts. I would pull it up, but it's behind my green screen, so I can't grab it. Uh, Kevin Smets, uh, another fun show, brother man. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. We love that you're back on the show, brother man. Great Thank you. observations. Love your hot takes. I love that you try to get us uh, in trouble and canceled. It's Every always time. great to have that element <laughs> here on the show. Please let people know where they can find you, what you got going on, my brother. Well, before I do that, uh, oh, again, God. with this outline, it's so good. Yes, and I'm going to say so. I misread this outline since I started on the show. So at the bottom it says like to plug our social medias or whatever, mm. and for KS it says socials and projects of choice. But since the beginning, I always th thought it said and projects of course. And so in my head, I thought you were quoting um, Kitster. Uh, uh, finish the race, of course. <laughs> this whole time, I thought that projects of course was your Kitster, like being cheeky and funny but it says projects of choice so in yeah. that i will say that uh yeah i do have the scoundrels inc uh which you can find us on youtube and on apple podcasts and uh they have a discord too if you, if you search that you could join in the fun and all the conversations there and then reventrilogy.com i'm still in, we're doing those kotor those kotor projects of course the kotor project we just released a clip last week it got a lot of uh got a lot of fun and a lot of love and i did want to nice. say 
back to the fans of the Jedi way. Like it's great to be home. Like I consider this home and I consider oh. the fan, all the comments that were ha- uh, left uh, just saying like, glad that he's here and healthy. Oh, no. And, you know, notwithstanding a couple that disagreed with my whole stabbing thing. Like I didn't know star Wars was GI Joe or everybody just <laughs> gets exploded out and they have the parachute. They jump out of the thing. No, I'm just kidding. But you know, to all the fans, <laughs> thank you so much for all the nice comments about, look, I got pit stains. I'm just freaking out over here. Uh, to all the nice comments that you guys said, it makes me feel good that like, uh, that, you guys want me here because like i always told them from the very beginning like i'll do this show but i want to make sure that i'm not encroaching on what you guys had because you guys had such a magic formula and hopefully you guys just goosebumps right here because i really love being on the show hopefully you guys yeah uh, you guys have been so warm and welcoming to me and i appreciate that uh and uh yeah i'll be around to try to get us canceled every week so i appreciate that <laughs> of course <laughs> finish the race of course of course um, as for me, you can find me at the Roka says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, the Outlaw Nation on Twitch, my YouTube channel, youtube.com down below. Please subscribe to the channel down below. Hit that subscribe button, hit that bell button. Yes, as Kevin and Laura both pointed out, please leave your comments. Let us know what you think about everything we talked about. Do you agree, disagree? Some of you want to come after me for the Hayden Christensen? Feel free to do that as well. We appreciate all comments down below. Keep them civil, but we appreciate your comments down below uh, as well. And my other podcast, the uh, Hot Mike, the Cinephiles. Uh, and the Geek Buddies, they're out there for you all to enjoy as well. All right, Laura, what do we have to tell them before we wrap up here? Until next time, of course, your focus determines your reality. (laughs) 